Welcome to Conversations on the Coast, San Francisco's premier author interview program. We are going to talk today to John Elder Robeson. I'm using his full name because his mother used to call him John Elder. Well, it kind of sets you apart, and it tells that I'm from the South. That's right. That's what it is. It's always Mary Lou and Jimmy Bob and John Elder. John Elder. The title of his book is Look Me in the Eye. And the subtitle is very important here, My Life with Asperger's. And it's published in paperback now, after being on the New York Times bestseller list as a hardcover, by Three Rivers Press, which is an imprint of Crown Publishing. We do all of that identification so that the publishers remain friendly. You start the book out, I think, in a, in, in a way that was very helpful, uh, at least to me. Uh, you say 60 years ago, the Austrian psychiatrist Hans Asperger wrote about children who were smart with above average vocabulary, but who exhibited a number of behaviors common to people with autism, such as pronounced deficiencies in social and communication skills. The condition was named Asperger's syndrome in 1981. In 1984, it was added to the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of mental disorders used by mental health professionals. Asperger's has always been with us, but it's a condition that has flown under the radar until quite recently. Anything you'd like to add to that technical definition? There's a lot of talk that there's an explosion in Asperger's Mm -hmm. among kids in the school systems. It is true that there's an unexplained increase in kids with significant autistic impairment, kids, for example, who are nonverbal. Okay. I believe that kids with Asperger's like me simply went undiagnosed in the 1960s because if you were diagnosed with anything in 1960 when I was a little kid— you were called retarded and you could be sent to a state school and it was a really, really bad thing. And, and I I think we just grew up and we struggled and we made our way. There's probably just as many of us out there, but we're undiagnosed in a free range state. But you really had a, had a very tough time early on. I mean, the business of not being able to socialize was very, very difficult. The business of uh, saying things that were deemed to be out of order when you were trying to engage in conversation really kind of put you off in a corner, didn't it? It did, you know, and it wasn't what I wanted at all. I wanted more than anything to have other kids like me. I wanted to make friends with grown-ups, but I couldn't read their body language. I couldn't read the tone of voice. I couldn't read their faces, and as a result... Things like sarcasm would totally pass me by. Someone would would say, that's great, when I dropped something on the floor. And, and what would I do? I would say, okay, I could do it again because I didn't know any better. Ah, yeah. So you would get, get yourself into a lot of verbal jams and very uncomfortable situations. And that, of course, would lead you to not talking. It really would, you know. It it might seem funny when you look at it, and you see it today in children all over. It looks funny to gaze on them as a grown-up, but it was just crushing for me as a four-year-old and five-year-old. At one point, you you write in the book this kind of childhood lament. I would never fit in, you write. Why was I alive? That's heavy. It was a bad time, you know, for me being a kid, and I see it today. So many young people with Asperger's, because kids like me started out with a deficiency in emotional intelligence, Mm -hmm. people see the disability aspects of our condition almost exclusively when we're young, the gift aspects of us. You know, our fascination with, say, technology or science or whatever it may be, those gifts don't really shine through until we're older. So it's a painful time being a child. One of the ways you tried to win acceptance uh, I thought was very, very interesting. You, 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 wanted, you tried to win acceptance by becoming a trickster. 
Uh, you, that's what you call it in, in the book. You, for example, pull the trick on a biology teacher. You know, people laughed at me, and I realized that if I could play tricks, they'd laugh with me, and I could feel good about laughter instead of feeling bad. And, and that was my first step to making friends. And some of it was, was quite involved. Uh, the one that I remember the most is uh, getting a mannequin and hanging the mannequin, not from a tree, but was from a power pole. Well, that was that was a good trick. That's the best I can say for it. <laughs> the fire department didn't particularly like, but no, that's a, at any rate. Look me in the eye is full of surprises, like the author's involvement with the band Kiss. Stay tuned. You're listening to Conversations on the Coast with Jim Foster. Follow us on Twitter at Jim Foster C O C. Or send an email to jimfostercoc at gmail.com. Look me in the eye is the book, the subtitle, My Life with Asperger's. The author is John Elder Robeson, published by Three Rivers Press and now in paperback. Entertainment Weekly, in part, said this about the book. It's a fantastic life story told with grace, humor, and a bracing lack of sentimentality. This story, as it goes on, could have gotten very sentimental, and I and I I really think it's wonderful that it that it didn't. On the other hand, there were some things keeping it from ever being sentimental. Well, I'm not a sentimental guy. Yeah, but I mean, part of the story. I mean, beatings by your father. That's terrible, and I don't. I mean, when I read the book, I I don't know that that was so connected with who you were as. To who he was. Well, there were some tough aspects to my childhood. My father was an alcoholic and, and I had trouble with him. My mother suffered from mental illness. But you know, we make the best of the life we know, and that's how I grew up. And when you read Look Me in the Eye and you get to the end of the book, you'll see that there is redemption even between my father and me. Thank God. Thank God. And you also working under a, uh, under a burden because you were not actually diagnosed until you were 40 years old. I would say I kind of grew up in a, a free-range state. <laughs> but, you know, you referred to the book having a, a lack of sentimentality. People with Asperger's are like Mr. Spock on Star Trek, and you just sort of ask yourself, would Mr. Spock have uh, sentimentality uh. if he wrote a memoir? <laughs> And, no, no, uh, no. you know, a guy like me, we just sort of tell it like it is. You were, uh, like, like any uh, young, young boy, you were looking for acceptance. And one of the places that you found it was at the Electrical Engineering Department of the University of Massachusetts, where you found out, among other things, that you could fix five tape players in one afternoon. Well, that was a great thing for me. Being the child of college professors, I had the run of the lab facilities at the university. Right, That right. was where I got my knowledge of electronics, and when I combined that with a love of music, I was able to leave home and kind of launch myself into another world of misfits, which was, of course, you know, that of rock and roll musicians. Right, and then you kind of got to the top in the, in the sense that you became involved with KISS. Well, before KISS, I actually worked as the engineer for Pink Floyd Sound Company in the United uh, States, right. and that was how we actually got hooked up with KISS and with them. Because KISS was one of their clients. That's right, yeah. yeah. And with uh, KISS, I made all of Ace's guitars that shot fire, shot rockets, lit up, exploded. You can see them on YouTube today. You, you, made, you made guitars that exploded? Oh, yeah. We, we <laughs> had guitars... That burned so bright from the smoke bombs that it would burn the top three strings right off the guitars. He was playing his solo on stage. And the crowds just roared for those things. They loved him. <laughs> I, I'm inclined to ask two questions. <laughs> How did you do this and why? <laughs> well, what we did was uh, we took the pickup out of a Les Paul guitar. We hollowed the back of the guitar out with a router and we built a stainless steel box, and filled it with smoke bombs and aircraft landing lights. 
<laughs> I love the aircraft landing lights part. Of oh, it. they really were bright, did. and and this thing would come up as where in and when when the auditorium would, would dark and it, you know, all of a sudden it would. Be well, there. When, oh, when that thing came on, it would it would throw a square of light right to the back of the stadium, even in the biggest arenas in the country. It would reach all the way to the back. This involvement was so total uh, at one time that that you travel uh, with with Kiss. And, and one of the places that you traveled was Florida, where you had an encounter with a water moccasin. You know, that kind of illustrates the different thinking yes. that folks with Asperger's have. I opened the door to my hotel, and there he was. This is a water Just, moccasin was, coiled up on the pavement. He was sitting there. <laughs> yes. And, you know, I took the direct solution. I went back inside, and I got my gun, and I opened the door again, and I stepped out and sh- shot him as I went. And when the gun was Wait empty, the snake you, was in pieces you got in the grass. Your gun. Did you travel all the time with the gun at that period? Uh, back at that time, you know, we... Uh, you didn't have to go through that metal detectors then. I that, don't think. No, it was... That was long before... Yeah. That that was actually at a time when you could declare a gun at an airport and they would just put it in the front cabin of the plane. I see. I see. So you went and you, you, <laughs> you shot this thing. I shot the snake. Shot him dead. And and the uh, and then you 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 called the front desk and you said I just shot this moccasin water moccasin would you please send somebody down to clean up and you know they threw me out of the hotel <laughs> yes. they weren't grateful at all but when they called the sheriff he looked at me and he said by gum if I couldn't kill that snake with that I'd just back up and wish him good day and you had seen that guy over at yep. the concert hall as part of security oh. Look Me in the Eye has a number of astonishing moments. When we come back, I want to share one that stopped me dead in my tracks. You're listening to Conversations on the Coast with Jim Foster. Follow us on Twitter at Jim Foster COC or send an email to Jim Foster COC at gmail.com. This is Jim Foster. It is Conversations on the Coast. Look Me in the Eye, My Life with Us. Burgers. That's the title, the author John Elder Robeson, and the publisher Three Rivers Press. The book is now a paperback. You may have heard about it before. Publishers Weekly had some interesting things to say about it. Robeson succeeds, they wrote, in his goal of helping those who are struggling to grow up or live with Asperger's to see how it is not a disease, but a way of being. A way of being that needs no cure except understanding and encouragement from others. I think that's a terribly, terribly important point. My book is really a celebration of being different and coming out on top. And it's, in that sense, really larger than a story about Asperger's because I write about feeling like everyone was going to laugh at me in high school. But, you know, now that I'm grown up, I realized that you and everyone else was afraid you were going to get laughed at in the same high school. Maybe I was more ridiculous than you, but the fact is we felt the same. And really, it's a story of the human condition and how, indeed, I triumphed and turned a disability into a strength. And everyone has those traits, and everyone has those opportunities. And that's why you talk about a continuum uh, from autism to Asperger's, to normal, which we should almost put in quotes, I think. Well, it really is. It kind of blends seamlessly. You know, there are so many people, especially out here in California, you've got thousands and thousands of engineers. Mm -hmm. And you know, the next step beyond Asperger's is called geek, engineer, and scientist. (laughs) That's a, and there's lots and lots of people that will oh, see themselves. I hope, I hope they're listening in Silicon Valley today. <laughs> that'll get their that'll get their attention. One of the astounding points that you make in the book is in looking back at your life uh, toward the, the toward the end of the period that you're covering in, in the book. Looking back, you say that the kinds of things that you invented for KISS and so on during your music period, you could not do now. That amazed me. It's interesting that my brain has rewired itself, and it's an example of what scientists now call brain plasticity. 
I have immeasurably more emotional intelligence and I am more personable and and friendly than Mm -hmm. I was then, Mm -hmm. but I don't have the sort of edge of scientific brilliance that I had when I was 25. You don't you don't have that singleness of, of focus that you had at that time. Not Is that on, what it comes down to? Well, I don't have the singleness of focus on science and technology, but look at me today. I'm very driven to go out and deliver an inspirational and hopeful message to all of these young people, to families who are struggling. Uh, I'm still very driven, just not in in the a same way, way. Yeah, in the technical way. I, th- I think that's good. I really do. I think that's a wonderful thing. I really, really do. Before you go, I, I would like you to to read from the closing passages of the book. Would you share those with us? Sure. I'll be glad to read that for you. Before I go, I'd like to address one last question. Is it possible to know whether the thoughts expressed in my book also reflect the inner life of autistic people who have difficulty speaking for themselves? When I first appeared in public and met autistic folks who did not speak, I asked myself, could they be like me? That's a very profound question and perhaps impossible to answer until the first nonverbal autistic person is able to tell us about his or her inner life. What I do know is that all of us have far more in common than we realize. I have spoken to many, many people since the release of my book, and it has become clear to me that my thoughts and feelings are not unique to me or even other people with autism. If it sometimes seem that, seems that way, that's because people with autism may express their feelings in ways that non-autistics find puzzling or inscrutable. Yet our underlying feelings are very often the same as those of neurotypicals. Our responses may appear totally neutral while inside we are crying. You cannot reliably evaluate our state of mind by our outward demeanor. One last thing. I may look and act pretty strange at times, but deep down, I just want to be loved and understood for who and what I am. I want to be accepted as part of society, not an outcast or outsider. I don't want to be a genius or a freak or something on display. I want empathy and compassion from those around me, and I appreciate sincerity, clarity, and logicality in other people. I believe most people, autistic or not, share this wish. And now, with my newfound insight, I'm on the way to achieving that goal. I hope you'll keep those thoughts in mind the next time you meet someone who looks or acts a little strange, like me. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. My only hope is that your message gets way out there and that there are now resources for parents like your parents were, you know, befuddled and what should I do and that there are better answers now than there were way back then. Well, I sure hope so too. That's why I'm here. The book is Look Me in the Eye, My Life with Asperger's. The author is John Elder Robeson. This has been Conversations on the Coast and I'm Jim Foster. Follow us on Twitter at Jim Foster C-O-C. Or send an email to jimfostercoc at gmail.com.